In the last lecture, we defined formally the notion of perfect secrecy. In this lecture, we'll see a construction that achieves that definition. Just to remind you of our definition, we'll say that an encryption scheme <clears throat> defined by the three algorithms gen, enc, and dec, and with message space given by m, is perfectly secret if for every possible probability distribution over the message space, any message in that message space, and any ciphertext, it holds that the a posteriori probability that the message is equal to m conditioned on the observed ciphertext being equal to c is exa exactly equal to the a priori probability that the message is equal to m. <clears throat> Where this a priori probability is exactly the uh, given probability distribution uh, that we start with. The scheme that we'll see that achieves this definition is known as the one-time pad. This scheme has actually an interesting history. Uh, it was patented in 1917 by Vernum, although recent historical research indicates that actually it was invented at least 35 years earlier. The scheme was patented in 1917, but there was no notion of perfect secrecy until the later work of Shannon in the 1940s. In addition to defining the notion of perfect secrecy, uh, as we've defined it here, Shannon also proved that the one-time pad scheme does indeed achieve that definition, i.e. that the one-time pad is indeed perfectly secret. So here's the one-time pad encryption scheme. First of all, we're going to let our message space be equal to 0, 1 to the n. This is some notation that I'm going to use frequently in this course, and so I want to highlight it. Uh, the notation 0, 1 to the n means the set of all strings, of all binary strings, of length exactly n. So the set of all n-bit strings. The key generation algorithm will choose a uniform key k, also from the set of all n-bit strings. That is to say that the key is a uniform n-bit string. Each possible n-bit string is chosen with probability 1 over 2 to the n. Right, there are 2 to the n different strings of length n. To encrypt a message m using the key k, what we do is we simply XOR the key with the message bitwise. This means that the ith bit of the ciphertext is equal to the XOR of the ith bit of the key with the ith bit of the message. Decryption just reverses the process. To decrypt a ciphertext C, which is going to be a string of length n, using a key k, also a string of length n, we simply XOR the two together, again using bitwise XOR. So the message that we output is simply the key XORed with the ciphertext. You can go through the exercise of checking that this scheme is indeed correct, right? That when we decrypt the encryption of a message M, using the same key both for encryption and decryption, we recover the original message. And I've gone through that here. So the decryption using key K of the encryption of M using key K means that, right, we look at the inner portion, uh, the encryption of M using K is just KX or M. The decryption of that using the same key is obtained by simply XORing K with that. Because XOR is associative, we can rewrite that as k xor k, quantity xor'd with m. And then we have the nice property that any string xor'd with itself is equal to the zero string. And that comes from the fact that a zero xor'd with a zero is equal to zero, and also a one xor'd with a one is equal to zero. And then the zero string xor'd with m simply gives back m itself. So again, this just shows that decryption does indeed recover the original message. In pictures, we have this diagram here where the message and the key are both n-bit strings, n-bit blocks if you like. And what we do is we simply XOR them together, resulting in an n-bit ciphertext that's output by this process. What we want to do is to prove that the one-time pad is perfectly secret. So remember that in order to do this, we need to show that no matter what distribution on the messages we start with, for any message and any ciphertext, the probability that the message was equal to m, conditioned on observing that ciphertext, is exactly equal to the a priori probability that the message was equal to m. 
So let's just fix some arbitrary distribution over the message space and fix some arbitrary message M and ciphertext C. Right, the message space and the ciphertext space here are both the set of all n-bit strings. What we need to do, again, is to prove that regardless of our choices of the distribution and regardless of our choices of M and C, the probability that the message was equal to M, conditioned on the ciphertext being equal to C, is exactly the a priori probability that the message was equal to M. Now, it's a little bit diff difficult to think about this because we don't know what that a priori distribution is. But let's keep going and work with this expression and see what we come up with. The first thing we're going to do is to just rewrite this expression using Bayes' law. So using Bayes' law, we get that the probability that the message was equal to M, conditioned on the ciphertext being equal to C, is equal to the probability that the ciphertext is C, conditioned on the message being equal to M, times the probability that the message was equal to M, divided by the probability that the ciphertext was equal to C. Let's compute the probability that the ciphertext takes on the fixed value lowercase c. Well, we can use the law of total probability to express it in the following way. It's simply the summation over all possible messages m prime of the probability that the ciphertext is equal to c conditioned on the message being equal to m prime times the probability that the message is equal to m prime. Right, the events uh, m equal m prime do indeed partition the space because the message has to take on some value and the only possibility is that, those that of, of those values are the message, every message in the message space. If we keep going, we can rewrite that conditional probability in the following way. The probability that the ciphertext is equal to C, conditioned on the message being equal to some value M prime, is exactly equal to the probability that the key, right, capital K was the random variable denoting the key, it's exactly equal to the probability that the key takes on the value m prime xor c. This is a crucial point, and this is actually the first point in the proof where we're relying on the specifics of the one-time pad scheme. Okay, everything up till now uh, was generic and uh, applied for any, any possible scheme. Here's the first time we're using something specific about the one-time pad, and so I want to go over this carefully and make sure you understand why it's true. So again, we, we claim that the probability that the ciphertext is equal to C, conditioned on the fact that the message is equal to M prime, is equal to the probability that the key is equal to the value M prime X or C. Why is that the case? Well, if we condition on the fact that the message is equal to M prime, then the only possible way the ciphertext can be equal to the fixed string C is if the key is equal to M prime X or C. And you can check this, because if you XOR the message M prime with the key M prime XOR C, you get the ciphertext C. And if you write it out uh, as an algebraic equation, you'll see that the only possible value of the key for which that happens is the key M prime XOR C. What's the probability that the key is equal to the fixed string M prime XOR C? Well, M prime XOR C is just some fixed n-bit string we said that the one-time pad encryption scheme chooses the key uniformly from the set of all possible n-bit keys. So the probability that the key takes on any particular value is exactly 2 to the minus n. So we've reduced the probability that the ciphertext takes on the value c to the summation over all messages m prime in the message space of 2 to the minus n times the probability that the message is equal to m prime. Now, it might look like we're stuck, right? We don't know anything about this probability distribution. It's an arbitrary distribution. So we don't know what the probability is that the message takes on any particular value in the message space. However, we do know that regardless of what the distribution is, it's a valid probability distribution. And so summing over all possible messages M prime in the message space, the probability that the message takes on that value must be 1. Right? Remember that probabilities must sum to 1. So this expression reduces simply to 2 to the minus n. And what we have is that the probability that the ciphertext takes on any particular value c is exactly equal to 2 to the minus n. Coming back to our expression uh, that we want to evaluate, 
we have that the probability that the ciphertext is equal to C, given that m is equal to m, is again the probability that the key takes on the value m x or C. This is exactly like before. I've just replaced m prime with the particular message m that we're interested in. We carry around, uh, we carry the probability that m is equal to m, and on the previous slide we calculated that the probability that the ciphertext is equal to C is exactly 2 to the minus n. Now again, the probability that the key is equal to the particular string m x or c is exactly 2 to the minus n. And now we see that the 2 to the minus n in the numerator and denominator cancel, and we're left simply with the probability that m is equal to m. That is the probability that the message is equal to some particular message, little m. And now we're done, right? What we've shown is that for any distribution over the message space, and arbitrary, uh, any arbitrary message and arbitra arbitrary ciphertext, the probability that the message was equal to m, conditioned on observing the ciphertext being equal to c, is exactly equal to the a priori probability that the message was equal to m. This completes the proof that the one-time pad achieves perfect secrecy. Just to summarize, we did it, right? We came up with a definition of perfect secrecy, we formalized it mathematically, we showed a particular encryption scheme, the one-time pad, and then proved that that encryption scheme satisfied our definition. Right? This achieves the goals that we set out for ourselves for ourselves a few lectures back. In the next lecture, we'll talk about implementing the one-time pad. Uh, there's nothing particularly difficult here, but it's interesting actually to explore some of the um, implementation level details that arise when trying to code it up, and it also can give an alternate way of looking at and understanding the scheme. So again, we gave, you came up with a definition of perfect secrecy, that was in the last few lectures. Uh, in this lecture we showed a scheme achieving that definition. What we'll see later on is that we're not done. Right? The one-time pad has a number of drawbacks that we'd like to address, and after we talk about implementing the one-time pad, we'll come back and revisit those drawbacks and explore to what extent we can avoid those.